Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. If you could return to your seats and direct your attention back up here, we are ready for the main event, what you've all been waiting for. Um, first of all, let me do a special shout out. I don't know if we have any former service members or current service members in the audience, but I would like to thank you for your service and happy Veterans Day. So let me quickly get to the task at hand. You obviously were earlier wowed by Lisa Lambert. Lisa began her career as a software engineer at Owens Corning and has been on an upward trajectory ever since. Most recently at Intel Capital, where she currently holds the title, apparently multiple titles, um, but the most recent addition to her list of titles is Vice President, Managing Director, Diversity Equity Fund. Please welcome to the stage founder and CEO, Lisa Lambert. Now, your guest speaker tonight, uh, Sally has, cross check has been called many things in her career. <laughs> and I mean that in a loving way. Uh, she's been called a CEO, a trailblazer, an entrepreneur, and famously on the cover of Fortune magazine as the last honest analyst on Wall Street. Woo! That's saying something. Honesty, integrity. She's played her career out on a global and very public stage, ending up on just about every business magazine and publication cover and every recognition list that you can name. She was recently number nine on Fast Company's 100 Most Creative People of 2014. She's been on both Fortune's and Forbes' list of most powerful women in business multiple times, and she was one of Time Magazine's global business influentials. Now Sally's taken the fight on behalf of Women in Equality Global as the owner and chair of Elevate, formerly, former, formerly wow, that was so hard, uh, <laughs> formerly 85 Broads, a now 34,000 member global professional women's network. Woo! Amazing. More importantly, and we're on the front edge of this announcement, I believe, literally 24 hours, 48 hours away, that's not enough for Sally. This is apparently what retirement looks like, interesting. Um, Sally is now starting a new venture that's going to close the gender investing gap. It's a company called Elevest, and it's a digital investment platform for women, and she just got her first round $10 million in Series A funding. So this group is going to have early access to this information, so you'll probably hear more about that in a minute. Um, what you may not know about Sally is that she wasn't really always this amazing. It's true. I know. It's hard to believe. Um, in, a, in a quote from an article about 20 years ago, I read that, that she grew up, this is, these are her words, super dorky. She had the glasses, she had the braces, she had the corrective shoes. It couldn't have been harder, right? This is good news for young women everywhere, especially super dorky young women like my daughter. Um, and if you stalk social media, uh, if you stalk Sally on social media, you'll find out that you really never want to get in between her and her UNC Tar Heels. That's all I'll say. Please welcome to the stage, Sally Krawcheck. Woohoo! Thank you, thank you. Yeah, okay. Amazing, amazing. It's such an honor for me to be here with you uh, to really discover your experience on Wall Street. It's so hard to do what you did. <laughs> I mean, it seems honestly impossible. I mean, I've worked in the financial services industry for you know, almost two decades now, and there, there's nobody doing what you did. So tell us a little bit about how you went about it. I mean, I know you started as a research analyst. Yep but you made it into the C-suite at so many different companies, and you were so effective. How did you do it? Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Lisa, and I love what you're doing, and I love this group. This is about my favorite thing in the world. Women getting together, networking, helping each other, drinking wine. I mean, honestly, it doesn't get any better than this. I think it's amazing. So how did I, th yes, applause. Um, <laughs> How did, how did I do it? So there's the typical answer, right? There, it's a lot of hard work. Um, it was a lot of grit. It was a lot of resilience. I mean, you went through 
some of the highlights of my career. You know, the highlights, right? I was a research analyst. I ran Bernstein. I ran Smith Barney. I ran Merrill. I was a CFO. I ran U.S. Trust. I mean, I did this stuff. What you didn't mention is I hold one very important world record. Um, and that world record is I'm the only woman on the planet who's been fired on the front page of the Wall Street Journal twice. Woohoo! Hey, if you're going to do it, do it big. Do it big. Do it on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And, and look, I can, you know, I, I get, I feel weird about that a lot. And, and I, you know, don't want people to know. And I get sort of embarrassed about it. But the truth is, I think I got fired for the right reasons. Um, and the truth is, I learned a lot about falling down and getting back up. But at the end of the day, I think the, the reason that I've done it is because I got to tell you, I think it's really all about perspective. And, and I know, I get it, right? He makes more money than I do and that upsets me. And they're having a meeting without me and that upsets me. And Wall Street was ma white male middle-aged into the downturn and it came out whiter, maler, and middle-ager and that upsets me. Yes. That is true, by the way. And by the way, I always like to say I love white middle-aged guys. I've been married to a couple of them. So <laughs> I, I totally... Not at the same time, I, though, no? <laughs> no, not at the same time, Lisa. So I get, and, and by the way, I've got two kids, I've got two stepkids, I've got two cats, right? So I understand the whole not making it for the school play in time. I get it all. I think that for me, I just think this is so frigging awesome. I mean, there's food on the table. We're, we, were, we weren't born in a slum. Our parents cared enough and my parents sacrificed enough to educate us. You know, the kids are healthy, the marriage is good. Honey, I'm playing with house money at this stage. And for me, I cannot believe it. If you had told me at the age of, thank you for bringing up my adolescence, what a treat. If you had told me when I was bullied by all the other girls and sitting alone on the playground, I mean like literally eating my lunch alone, that I would do anything important enough to be on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, even getting fired. It changes your perspective from, honey, do you think anybody saw the Wall Street Journal today? <laughs> to score, dad, I'm on the front page of the paper. <laughs> it's a whole different thing. Exactly, it's all about perspective. I think it's awesome. I mean, I can't believe we get to hang out. With, I get to hang out with folks like you. I cannot believe it. Yeah, it's amazing, it is. Yeah. You know, and I'm kind of jumping into it because I know we have a hard stop, so I want to make sure we get to the meat of it. I think a lot of us face politics and we face bad bosses and yeah. we face unequal opportunity. Yeah. How did you deal with all of that? You know, I think Cindy did a great job talking about unconscious bias. We know that's going on uh, as well. Yeah. We all have yeah. it. But how do you overcome it? Because you clearly overcome it, overcame it, and there's so few women that do it. I, I did and I didn't. And I think there is, I think what's so great about what's going on now is we're having these discussions. No one talked to me about this when I went to Wall Street. And no one talked to me about it the entire time I was at these firms. And so I really had to find my way. I lucked into the research analyst job. I, I wasted my 20s. I was a very mediocre investment banker. And my first level of success really came when I had the insight, as so many, so many young women do, at the age of 29 years and 11 months, that I should be an equity research analyst. I mean, it was like, bam, I know it, right? Yeah, right. And so I went off, I became an equity research analyst, and I had an infant at home. And I stumbled into a job that was very, very, where success and failure were very clear. Very clear. Did the stocks that I picked go up? Did the ones that I have sales on go down? It was very clear. The, was the research report helpful to the portfolio manager or not? I never, ever, ever had anybody reject a research report of mine because I'd written it on a Saturday night after my infant was asleep as opposed to a Thursday afternoon. Mm -hmm. So within the context of Wall Street, I lucked into the only flexible job. Now, I worked hours that you can't imagine, but they were my hours. And that's what I, the advice I give to folks today is unconscious bias exists. Either find a job where it is clear what success and failure is, and you've got that scorecard, 
or have that conversation with your boss, right? And not that you'll know it when you see it and you know, be a great part of the team. No, 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 what do the numbers look like? Right. Because I've found again and again, I have one example at Merrill, we did a huge restructuring. The guy who actually co-ran the gender diversity group for me, it was a white guy, came to me after the restructuring and said, I'm sorry to tell you this, Sally, but you know, all the people we, who keep their jobs in the restructuring are men. And he went through every example, and I said, those sound so great, you're right, you know, these guys have great results. I said, why don't you show me the numbers? And he came back with the numbers, and when he came back with the numbers, there were people of color and women on the list, you know, because of his unconscious bias. And yes. so I think it's, it gets to what are the numbers and recognize the reality. The other thing I'll say is I used to test very carefully how I could speak so I could be heard, right? And it's not fair, but I found that men could lose their temper at work and still be heard, and that women could not. And the other thing I found um, is that in addition to being very fact-based, very numbers-based, for me, humor worked. That cutting through a situation with humor as opposed to being so deadly serious all the time yeah. on Wall Street was effective. And Tar Heel basketball works for oh, everything. Oh yeah, that helps too. Everything, everything. <laughs> Use everything you've got. Yeah. Tell us about the Merrill situation. Yeah. I know, you know, on principle, you thought you know, money should be given back to your yeah. customers. Your, your boss didn't think so. You went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth again. Yeah. What happened? That happened. Um, <laughs> so actually, so one correction was actually Smith Barney. Smith so, Barney, correct. Yeah, so I'll tell you what happened. And, and I'm going to start with a horrifying statement that took me a long time to get to. For years, when people said to me after I was invited to leave Smith Barney, Sally, did you get fired because you're a woman? I would absolutely not, absolutely not. It was a good old fashioned boardroom brawl. My boss and I didn't agree, absolutely not. The answer is yes. The answer is <laughs> I was fired because I'm a woman and let me tell you why. So first of all, the story is that going into the downturn, the 2007, 2008 downturn, we had sold to our Smith Barney clients, just a sub-segment of them, so a couple billion dollars out of $1.7 trillion of assets, some alternative investments that were sold as low risk. When the market was bad, they were supposed to go down about eight cents on the dollar. They were actually high risk, nobody's fault. They were high risk, we just made a, a mistake. And when the market went down, they went down 100 cents on the dollar. As Lisa said, I went to my boss, I said we should, I think, do something unconventional. We should partially reimburse clients. And if we, if we do, I think the clients will be upset that they'll stay with us. And if we don't, I think the clients will leave us. And all I could think about was the clients and how we had upset, done wrong by them. And all I could think about and the argument I kept making to the boss was this will be a positive long-term thing. It'll kill us in the short term. We went back and forth. He said no, I said yes. He said no, I said yes. He stopped talking to me. I lurked outside his office. It ended up going to the board. The board found out about it, called us up. We debated it in front of the board. I won, and then he fired me, which is what happens, right? And I knew, I knew there was a point at which I knew that if I took one more step, the best case was we would partially reimburse the clients and I'd get fired. And the worst case is we wouldn't and I'd get fired. And so I took the step and I got fired. Why do I think it was because I was a woman? Well, one, I was the only, actually it was at City at the time, I was his only direct report, a P&L individual who was a woman. Today they still don't have one. Now, you know, what, 10 years later or what, eight years later. Um, and the reason I've come to the conclusion that I was a woman because I was so frigging different from everybody else. Yeah. The research tells me that we women are enormously client and relationship focused. Yeah. And I kept talking to him about the people. The research also tells me we are long-term focused and gentlemen are short-term focused, neither good, neither bad. But that's all I could think about, right? And as the emotion is left, I said, I was by myself. The research tells me this is how women act. I'm a woman. They got rid of me, right? So they got rid of me not because I have breasts, right. right, or different body parts, but because I was different. And at that point in a crisis, they did not want different. It, what is that about? I mean, why? I mean, there's so much talk now about the value of diversity. There's been study after study that proves that diversity of thought, diversity of perspective, yeah. experience, 
uh, adds value. It, it probably slows down decision making, but it makes it more effective decision making. Yep. So why are we not getting this? Why is it not being yeah. discussed in the boardrooms and the C-suites? It is being discussed in the boardrooms and the C-suites. And I tell you, the other world record that I hold is that I've worked directly for seven financial services CEOs yeah. directly. So I've been on about 12 wow. different teams, and you've hit the nail on the head. The, the most, efi most efficient decisions are made by non-diverse teams, because yeah. everybody, yay, yeah, yeah, I yeah. agree. I call it the false comfort of agreement. The most effective decisions by diverse teams, but they're slower. Here's what happened during the downturn. It, but this is actually, what, it, it's not unusual. If you go through a crisis, the population becomes less diverse. And the reason is not, you know, because they're trying to get rid of the women or the people of color or whatever, but it's, they circle the wagons because you know what, that research, Lisa, I believe it, but we don't have the luxury of taking the chance now. We need somebody we can trust, yeah. which means we need somebody who looks just like me because I know I can trust me. And so if you start off with a majority of guys, you end up with a bigger majority of guys. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, in, in my business, in Venture Capital, 96% of the oh, general partners are, I know. are men. <laughs> and then that model just perpetuates itself because I it's know. a comfort zone. It's a comfort uh, zone. And, uh, you know, to me, Ultimately, that, that's going to change, but there's, there's lots of resistance. So tell us about Elevest. I know this is your new passion. I, I did a lot of research on Sally in preparation for this, and one of the things I heard you say in an interview, that you slept through the crisis. But now that you are an entrepreneur, yeah. a founder of your own company, yeah. you wake up at 3.30 in the morning every morning. Well, I didn't say I slept through the whole about. crisis. I oh. slept at <laughs> night during the crisis. Yes. And the other thing I say... That's a good clarification. Yeah, that's a big difference. The other thing I say is that being an entrepreneur is harder than running Merrill Lynch, and I'm the only person who would know that. Yes. Right? So I, I think part of me is I'm trying to have the steepest so. learning curve of any 26-year-old woman I know. <laughs> or slightly older. So the other thing... In addition to um, being, feeling so fortunate um, and approaching work with a sense of, of joy, if you can, is meaning and purpose. Um, so I have another philosophy, which is I'm going to be alive for some number of years, and then I'm going to be dead for a super long time, mm. right? <laughs> and I have had this enormous good fortune to have these experiences in my life, and now I'm in a position that I may or may not at, at one time have asked for, um, but I've, been, I, I've got a set of skills, I have a set of knowledge, and there's a big problem in this country that I want to help make a dent in um, on several levels. And so, you know, if you think about it, and, and this group is such a high-powered group um, that I don't think it'll affect this group, but we have a retirement um, savings crisis in this country. And we ha the gap is about $13, $14 trillion in size. It's so big and ugly, we've stopped talking about it. The truth is, this is a woman's crisis, if you think about it, right? We live six to eight years longer than men. We retire with two-thirds the money of men. If there's a gap, it's our gap. 80% of uh, men die married, 80% of women die single. And if you start to recognize it as a gender crisis, then the solutions change. Right? And the solutions become getting a raise. That will actually close, if we, got, if we earned what gentlemen earned, that would close a third of the retirement savings gap. It's about a mandated parental leave. But the one issue over here that I don't think is being solved is the gender investing gap. And we women invest to a much lesser degree than gentlemen do. 68 to 70 percent of our cash of our, of our investable in assets are in cash, right? It's very different for men. And I know, having been in the industry, that Wall Street is really by men for men. The financial, these things never work on me. They they're never not, work not. on me. You I have think little ears. ears. It's little ears. I think I have small ears. <laughs> um, a big mouth, but small ears. Um, so a couple, of, a couple of numbers for you, right? Where Wall Street has been inaccessible to women. So the financial advisors who work for me, about 86% male. Their male clients love them. 
the male clients love them. They leave them at less, a rate of less than 2% a year. Women clients in the year after their husband die leave their financial advisor more than 70% of the time. Yeah. And as a result, Wall Street is doing a very, some advisors do a fantastic, fantastic job. There's some at the table um, with me who do a great, great job. But overall, the industry is really failing women. Yeah. And so at this stage of my life, uh, and by the way, the conventional wisdom about this, I think, is dead wrong, right? It's all about how it's a soft bigotry around women, yeah. about how we need more financial education, right? Yeah. About how we're scared of risk. Yeah, right? isn't your there husband was doing all that investing for you? Yeah. Right? yeah. Oh, I went to a CEO because when I came up with this, I said, well, I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm not going to do it. I went to a CEO who I knew, went through all the numbers with him about how we women control $6 trillion about how 90% of us control our money on our own at some point in our lives. He listened to me and he said, that is so interesting, Sally. Don't their husbands manage their money for them? Right, this Seriously? is a big really? company CEO. Oh and so there was even an article in the New York Times this weekend that talked about how, to, had us a little blurb in it because we're not launched yet, but talked about how women, their new offerings for women, it was written by a woman, that said we need more hand-holding than men do. Friggin' A, you gotta be kidding me. You gotta be right? kidding me. More hand holding. No, we do not. We don't need dumbed down. We don't need this soft bigotry. We, we're looking for different. We're looking for different, right? We, don't, we are not gonna watch, don't tweet this one, we're not gonna watch CNBC all day, right? We're not about outperforming this market and that market. The industry as it is today does not work for most women. So this is the most fascinating thing I've done in my entire life. I went out and hired a co-founder who is so different from me. We agree on almost nothing. Yes. I have hired folks from outside financial services. And, you know, we are building a platform. We, we've been engaged with women every week since the spring of last year. And we're building something that is going to be gorgeous and talk to us but it's going, to, it's going to be so smart, I think, and it's going to be so different from what's, what's out there. Um, so stay tuned. It's called L, it's L of S, E L L E V E S T. I want all of you to sign up for early access as soon as you leave here. If I can get on a red eye to Indianapolis, and there does exist one from here, and I would <laughs> lo if I can do that, then I'd love all of you to sign up so you can keep an eye on what we're doing because I think it's going to be really interesting. Who will do that? Yeah? Can we sign up? Really, I think this is amazing. Okay, so we are a career-oriented networking yep. group. So the question for you is, what would you do all over again now that you've you know, finished your career in the investment banking world? What would you change about the decisions you made, about the places that you went? I mean, I, I read yeah. that you said that when you took... My first the job. No, no, your first husband. Yeah. I changed my first husband. That was a good yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> but you see, one, one, of the, one of the positions, you worked at so many amazing companies, but one of the positions you said you took because it was there. Yeah. And you, you yeah. wish you hadn't done that. You wish you had negotiated more. You wish you had done a few other things. But besides your first husband, what else do you regret? Well, there was that. But, you know, um, and I've told him that. This won't be a surprise. You can tweet that. He knows, he knows that, I, that, that I think that was a mistake. Um, as does, you know, my ex-friend who he's married to now. Um, For real. It, Read guys, the story. It's, it's okay. I won. I won. Um, okay, settle down. Okay, so, look, what would I change? Yeah, look, you know, when, I, when, the, when the Merrill Lynch job came around, I took it because it was familiar to me. And, yeah, you know, Bank of America is a terrific company. It fit me like an itchy sweater. I didn't do my due diligence before going there because I was just so happy somebody offered me a job. And I wanted the chance to prove that the Smith Barney thing had been a fluke. So that was a mistake. Um, you know, I tell you one thing I'd, I'd love to go back. I, I will tell you truthfully. Um, for years, I had very diverse teams in place. I talked the talk, I walked the walk about diversity. I didn't truly, in my soul, believe in it. I did not believe in it, but it wasn't part of me. And it was really, Lisa, only after the financial crisis as I began to think about what had caused the financial crisis 
that I recognize lack of diversity, i.e. groupthink in the industry, yeah. was so much more of a major contributor than the, anybody out there recognizes, right? And we just haven't had as important a national conversation about that aspect of the crisis, you know, as I think we should have. So that's when I started, I really thought this gender diversity, diversity of background, of skin color, of thought, a perspective of age, we didn't have enough of it on Wall Street. What I'd like to do differently um, is help more women. And you were talking earlier, and that's what my career mission is by, right now, it's to help women achieve their professional and financial goals. That is what the rest of my life is going to be about because it's so important. Yes. Okay? Yeah, no, seriously. Now, wh why don't we? So there was a really interesting New York Times article a few weeks ago that talked about compassion for, it, for individuals who are going through difficult things. And I don't know if y'all saw it, it really struck home for me. It said that we, and particularly we women, tend to be very compassionate and helpful to people who are going through tough times. Unless we went through exactly the same things ourselves, in which case we lose our compassion. And what I saw for so many years on Wall Street, and I'm sure you see in your industry, is look, suck it up. You know, you yeah. think it's bad. Look, when I started at Solomon Brothers, I had a Xerox copy of a penis placed on my desk every day. Did I say penis? He said, she said penis. I said every penis, day. right? Every day. Every day. You have that happen to you at the age of 22, and other women come through, and you're like, you know, it's not nearly as bad as when I was there. Right. Right? right. Because you only had a line drawing of one put on your desk. Mine was a Xerox copy. <laughs> God. Seriously? And I think this, I think for all of us to take into account this, this empathy, just because it was harder for me doesn't mean I can't help you. And I don't think I fully recognized until recently that the pie can grow and that there can be more than one seat at the table because the, the table can grow. Yes. And we were talking at our, our table, what a time to be a woman, okay? Because we have this power I don't think we recognize. So my business that I'm growing, right? I mean, before, if I wanted to work, I had a, my only choice, work at a big company or don't work, right? Today, let me just give you a stat. I think this is amazing. Mm -hmm. I think it's amazing. The Merrill Lynch technology platform, part of which I built, which was built over time before me, state of the art, cost, I don't know, a billion, 1.3 billion, depending on what's been written off, but it starts with a B. Four years ago, um, I met with an entrepreneur who'd started something that looked kind of sort of like Merrill. Not as good, not as proprietary. His platform cost him 25 million. Elevest, by the time we launch, our platform is gonna cost us two, right? 1.3, 25 million, two. What I'm doing today, I couldn't do 10 years ago. I couldn't do five years ago. Some of the stuff, technology we're using, I couldn't have done six months ago. The world is changing so rapidly. We have power that we're only beginning to recognize because of changes in technology. We can help each other and support each other in a way that helps all of us, in a way that just wasn't the case 10 years ago. So if I could go back in time, yeah, I wouldn't take that job. Yeah, I wouldn't marry that guy, right? For sure. You know, for sure, <laughs> for sure. But I think I would, I wish I had recognized that earlier and put more muscle into this at an earlier time in my career. Do you think the change in technology and times and affluence of women uh, creates more opportunities for women to do what you're doing uh, or to be executives at investment banking, commercial banking firms? Because we really haven't seen much improvement since you've retired, right? I mean, no, it's gone backwards. Has, at least it's, it's gone, gone backwards. backwards. Yeah. Right? I don't know. I find it harder to be optimistic about investment banking and commercial banking because look, the CEOs sort of get it, the boards ask the right questions. The shareholders don't care, right? The shareholders are share renters. They're in for three to six months and they want to pop on it. So we were talking at our table about is it going to be some of the, the pension funds, the institutional investors? I don't know, I'm getting a little sick of it, you know? And whatever. But what is so fascinating, is happening, like it's not right and it's not fair that venture capitalists aren't funding enough women. It's not right and it's not fair. But I'm telling you with what's going on with crowdfunding and the availability of capital and the decline of the cost of starting businesses, 
We can have a huge impact over here if not one more guy ever changes his mind. And what's going to eventually happen to these big companies that is starting to happen now is it's not just, well, our ROE would have been higher if we'd had women, but that's a little sort of theoretical. They're starting to lose their talent because the talent, you know, the information is there yeah. and the talent saying, you know what, you're saying, you know, you're saying stuff at your town halls, but it's not happening. I'm out of here, buddy, because yeah. I'm going to go off and do this thing where I can control more of my life. Yeah, yeah, that's smart. We're in Silicon Valley, and there are a few bright spots here in terms of diversity at the top positions, IBM, yeah. uh, HP, Oracle, and in other industries like mm -hmm. General Motors, PepsiCo, etc. Do you expect to see, I guess two things. One, why aren't there more in, in your just general opinion? I know we talked about investment banking, yeah. but I think other industries may be more amenable to it. And you know, how have they done it, in your view? How are the women that are leading companies yeah. doing? So um, a fun fact um, about me um, is, do you know that I was Safra Katz associate at DLJ? I didn't is know that, that. I know. There's no reason you would know that, by the way. <laughs> I did a lot Actually, of do you know that my, my cousin dated Stephen Colbert for four years? I knew you that. Probably didn't. Did you know that one? <laughs> yes. There's actually, there's, actually an, there's actually an old, old, old video of Stephen when he was on HBO. There was a show you've never heard of in which they decided to use their girlfriend's names as characters. And because my cousin's name is Mackie, and that didn't sound like a girl, they used Sally. And so there's actually a line in one of them. It's a, ha a hazy, very young Stephen Colbert, in which he says, hey, look over there. I see Sally Krawcheck's underpants. That actually happened. That happened. I know. It's awesome. And he actually like saw your underpants? No. I, well, not that I know of. <laughs> That's like the most awesome thing that ever happened. OK, so back to this. Look, I think there is an issue, um, and I was the, I think the beneficiary of it, and some of the women you've talked about are, which is the idea of the glass cliff, right? And that women are often, sometimes, you know, brought in into these senior roles, you know, as a Meg Whitman has been, um, you know, as I was, when things are just really bad. Awful. Really bad. Yes. And so, you know, in my circumstance, I had been, as mentioned, you know, Wall Street um, used to do underwriting and research essentially in the same department. And when I was running Sanford Bernstein, which was this medium-sized sort of com research firm, I looked at this and said, that's a, a direct and enormous conflict of interest. Yeah. If one client base wins, the other loses, we can't do both, let's choose. So we just chose research. Our business suffered tremendously in fact, our clients even told us we, we made the wrong mistake. We were losing analysts. It was terrible. And then Elliot Spitzer came in, you know, determined that people were saying good things here and calling other things, you know, POSs in emails behind. And our star went like this, and that's when I was the cover of Fortune. Yeah. Smith Barney had gotten caught up in that, and Sandy Weil brought me in to turn it around. Yeah. Okay? You, you cannot convince me that he would have brought me in to turn that around if I had been a middle-aged white guy. That's right. He wanted something that, at the time I was young, right? He wanted something that looked and sounded and was so different from what had happened before that it almost shocked the system. Mm -hmm. And by bringing me in, who brought in a whole different way of doing business in a whole different stance, he made the point. That was tremendous for me. Many women suffer from it, right? That they are brought in, you know, at Mary Wall Street. Barra. Yeah. Aaron Callan. Marissa Meyer. Aaron Callan, Aaron Callan, who was the CFO of Lehman, was brought in, pushed out onto that glass cliff, was the face of Lehman. Everybody knew her because she stood out like a sore thumb. You know, when Lehman went down, that woman's career and, you know, yeah. parts of her life were destroyed. Were destroyed yeah. Right? And that was not her fault. I mean, the seeds of Lehman's demise were sown well before that. And so you see some women are able to step into these this blinding spotlight, these huge turnarounds which have been messed up before and they can make it happen. You know, and others, and, and the, the spotlight is just so stunning. And, yeah. and what's interesting, you watch it with Marissa right now, right? Yeah. What was fascinating to me is how enormously likable I was when I was a junior research analyst and a, you know, new director of research 
and, and how unlikable I became when I was successful and out on that cliff. Yes. And feel, you know, the press attention. And then when they fired me, all of a sudden I was like the likable person again. I said to my parents, have I changed since I was 18? And they said, not one inch, right? Mm -hmm. And so these are tremendously difficult, difficult, difficult situations to be in, but that's, that's where we get put. Should we avoid them? No. Should we take risks and do them? Look, I think it's, it's a question everybody has to answer for themselves. And, and when I was offered the opportunity at Smith Barney, um, you know, I went through the pros and cons, right? And, and what was the, the pro? The pro was this is an opportunity I never in my life thought I would have to turn around a storied American. I mean, it was John Houseman. We do business yeah. the old-fashioned way, yeah, right? We earn it. Um, and to go from, you know, I was running 283 people on a Tuesday and 35,000 on a Wednesday, wow. right? So, how, you know, you look at this, you say, oh my gosh. Yeah. And of course it was more money before Citigroup stock went down to below one, in which case it was a lot less money. <laughs> but big office. Yeah, I, 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 huge office. Huge I had office. a jet, I had two assistants. I had warm chocolate cookies delivered to my office every day at 3 p.m. Warm chocolate cookies. It was like, people were recognizing me, right? It was, okay, that's the upside. The downside was public failure and humiliation, right? And you look at this, and, and I guess there's some people who would say, you know what, I can't do that. You know, for me and for these other women that you're talking about, you go, that, that is asynchronous risk for me, that I think I can handle the public failure and humiliation, and indeed I got the opportunity to test yes, that out. Yes, you did. Out, twice. <laughs> Outstanding. 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 I got, I got um, an email from a friend of mine when it happened the second time, she said, you, you liked it so much, you did it again. You did it again. <laughs> Button. Love it. All right, I'm gonna give you all an opportunity to ask a couple of questions before we wrap up, but I wanna ask one final question. Yeah. Uh, women on boards, hot yeah. topic everywhere. And I know you were on the Dell board, you were on the yeah. Blackstone, Black, yeah. uh, Black yeah. Rock board, um, you're on to you now, and you're chairman, of course, of your company. Right. What's your take on the benefits of having women on boards and how you go about doing it? Okay, so I'd say a couple of things about this. Um, it is hard to argue against it, right? I could not possibly sit up here in front of this group and say, yeah, no, yeah, no, no big deal. Um, it is a big deal, and it's important, and we need to all continue to push for it. And what I love is that we have some of the, this damn thing, I, we, we have startups out there that are beginning to give us information about this. So, you know, as I, I think about tapping into our power, I, for one, don't really want to buy for, from companies that don't have women on their boards, that don't respect me enough to represent me on their board, right? Or in their senior management teams. So I'm loving it as this information is becoming more available. What I would say, though, is I don't think that should be our be-all and end-all. Um, and by that, I mean having been on boards and having interacted and engaged with boards. If you asked me, Sally, you've got you know, one thing you can work on, and it's either women on boards or women in senior management, I'd go with senior management every day of the week. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, having been on board, yeah, we set policies, we fly in, we ask, pertinent and searing and interesting questions, but it's, you talked about micro inequities. Mm -hmm. To me, it's the micro decisions that happen in a company that set the culture. And so having people of color in senior roles, having people of difference in senior roles, having women in senior roles who can make those very micro decisions that set it day to day, I think is as important, if not more important, than women awards. And of course, they're completely related, yeah, right? Sure. You know, as for being on boards, it is like the thing every, every woman I talk to wants to do, right? Well, I hear my goal is to be on board, my goal is to be on board, my goal is to be on board. Great, go for it. Personally, yeah, I'm not such a fan of it. Um, you know, for me, I, I, my rule is so, first of all, I love going deep on things. I loved being the research analyst, knowing more about this one issue, right? I'm gonna know more and share with the world more about women yeah. and investing over the next few years, uh, you know, than you can imagine. Yes. That's my thing. A board is thin and wide, 
right? Some people adore that. That's their thing. It's not as much my thing. So my rule for being on boards is that I need to get as much or more out of a board than they get out of me and make sure that I'm learning in some way that continues to develop me okay. because they're getting something out of me and vice versa. Um, but I just question that, you know, as you sort of think about what you want to do and what you want to accomplish because there is risk in being on a board yeah. and they take a friggin' lot of they time do. too. They really yeah, do. They do. They really do. Yeah, so focus on getting those senior operating roles and, yep. you know, maybe sideburn the And the then board. get on the right board. Get you on know, the right board. Be choosy, right? Boards are looking for accomplished women. And so don't just, you know, for the first one, mm -hmm. you know, but really think about what, you know, in addition to having it on the resume, which is cool, um, really think about what you're going to get from it. And then the other thing I would say that I really don't like is that there are now like a zillion programs to um, train us women to get on boards. There is not, I know a lot of men and I know a lot of men on boards and not a single one of them went to a training program. Right? And so again, I think it can be sometimes this soft bigotry, right, of somehow we need to be trained we need to, to be do educated. it. We, we, can, we can do it, I assure you, yeah. we can do it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to open up for a few minutes of questions in the audience. If you have questions, raise your hand and we're going to bring a mic over to you. There's a question here. I just think my ear is not, I think it's the wrong shape. It is. I think so, it's right? It's little. It's little. It's very beautiful, though. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay, please. Hi, Sally. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I work for Intel. I'm, I'm, a, I'm in a technical role. I'm an environmental, senior environmental engineer for Intel. I've also worked on the Women in Intel network, so that's, we call it WIN. I was one of the conference co-chairs this year for the Oregon site. And one of the most common issues that women face that I've heard, that I've experienced, is that they're not heard. That they have a great idea, they express that idea with enthusiasm, it's not heard. Five minutes later, a male colleague has the exact same idea, they, he shares that idea, and all of a sudden it's the best idea in the whole room, and, and that woman doesn't get credit for that idea. So I, would, I was wondering, this is something that's happened to me recently where I was sharing, I was sharing with the room. I'm not shy, so I'm more than happy to express my opinion, to yeah. share an idea. Yeah. And this wasn't heard. But fortunately for me, I had a male colleague who said, who was more, you know, more senior than I was. And he said, you know what, guys, this is a great idea, but let's come back to Kelly's idea. And for me, having that advocate was an amazing feeling and, and yeah. like it made my day. So I was wondering if you could share something like that may have happened to you, something similar, and what, what women can do when they're yeah. faced with that situation. Okay, I'm super excited to tell this story. Um, I really am. So what you've, you've hit on a couple things, right? And one of them is what I'm thinking of as the courageous conversation. What courageous conversation are you ready to have? Right, and for us as more senior women, are we ready to have the courageous conversation that is, Jim, Susie came up with that idea five minutes ago? Or Jim, and maybe this is a quiet, courageous conversation, do you realize you interrupted Susie 12 times in that meeting, but you never interrupted, you know, Steve? So what courageous conversation are we willing to have? Because if we're gonna wait for the guys to have the courageous conversation, it's never gonna happen. I've worked with more guys than anybody. Yeah. I've interrupted more guys talking about more stuff than anybody has ever done. And I have never, ever walked into a room and said, hey guys, what are you talking about? And they said, you know what, Sally, the, the power, the business power of gender diversity, that's what we're talking about, glad you're here. <laughs> never. So we're gonna have to do this. So I'm really thinking about using our power. I'm, I'm ready to have a big courageous conversation. Maybe you're ready to have a smaller courageous conversation, but what is the courageous conversation? Number one. Number two, mentors and sponsors. Mentors and sponsors, we all know it, right? But I want to tell, and mentors answer your questions, sponsors advocate for you, and then out of those you form your personal board of directors. I want to tell the Bank of America yes. firing story yeah. because I think it matters, okay? Um, so I had a sponsor early in my career. It was a fellow by the name of Weston Hicks. I was a research analyst. 
He read my research, he critiqued my research, he critiqued the way I spoke, he introduced me to his clients. It took four years off my career. I know that because the woman who started two weeks after me was smarter than me. She was a literal rocket scientist from MIT and I was more successful than she was earlier. So I had a control sample. He made my career. When I went to Bank of America, so Ken Lewis I mentioned, called yep. Sandy Weil, we need to turn around Merrill. Yep. Um, they brought me in. Ken said to me, I will never forget it, Sally, you have my word. This is gonna be hard, this is a hard culture. It's gonna be hard for you to come in. I'll be here for two years and my colleague will be here for two, you have four years. I said, great. Ken, thank you, because it's hard. He announced his retirement there, well now it's on, less than two months later. And I knew I was toast, right? I go to the new CEO, look, I'm not on your team, I'm happy to leave. He said, no, we need you because the attrition rate at Merrill of financial advisors at that point was running more than 50%. Jeez. They would have lost half of them. We, so over the next two years, we turned that baby around. Okay, we got the attrition rate to 6%. You can't get it below 6% because financial advisors are old and they die. Do not tweet that. <laughs> Do not tweet that, but I'm right, right? Right? I'm right, okay? So we got the attrition rate down to 6%, can't get any lower. We were the only business at Bank of America that was growing. We had just presented to the board that we were gaining share and we were 13.5% ahead of plan, which in financial service, in tech it happens, financial services it never happens. This is two years after I got there. I'm sitting in my office the day after Labor Day and I get called in the CEO's office and I'm terminated, okay? I mean, it was to the point where they said, it's to, you know, we're, we, we're gonna invite you to leave and I, I burst out laughing, I'm like, me? Like, not me? me, like the other guys who aren't meeting their plan and are shrinking. Yeah. And I went home um, and I drank wine <laughs> a lot. And, um, and I'll tell you what I did. i tell you what I did. I, uh, two, I gave myself a day to feel super sorry for myself. And one day later, I called the members of the board of directors of Bank of America. And for those who call me back, I said, I've got two things. I'd like to communicate to you. Number one, thank you for this opportunity to run Merrill Lynch. It was an absolute privilege and an honor. Number two, what could I have done better? And the answer I got was that in that boardroom, when they were saying, we're gonna reorg, we're gonna you know, cut out a, a couple people, we're da, da, da. I said, Sally, nobody fought for you. There was nobody in that room who said, what do you mean her? Not her, not her, right? And so the lesson to me is that having that ally in that room, and by the way, I think that conversation has to take place beforehand. You know, so I'm gonna present, and we need to do it with each other. The guys do it all the time. I'm gonna present this idea. I got your back on the next right. one, you have my back now. Exactly. Right. And not, you know, don't do it blindly, but let me take you through. This is what I'm going to do. How about, right? And do it for each other. It doesn't diminish us no. to second someone or to cheer for somebody. It actually elevates us, right? It makes us look more senior. It makes us more senior. And so the courageous conversation and having that mentor or sponsor, guys, it is the difference, the difference between success and failure. Excellent. One more question. We have time for just one more question. Where is it? Here. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, I may not be super eloquent, Sally, but um, I have a question. It's something Renee James brought up a couple years ago at Intel through a senior women's forum, but this idea of a barn door, of I'm a woman, I've moved forward and sort of I've got here and looking behind yourself and saying, figure it out for yourself. So uh, we have lots of women here today who are investing in themselves and interested on how to progress, but have you experienced the idea or the notion of I've achieved an accomplishment and you know, so be it, the rest of you need to figure it out, but how do we pull each other forward and be part of the solution versus a victim's mentality of, you know, oh, the, the system yeah. is causing this. Yeah, I, I have. Um, you know, at, 
at the same company, um, there was a senior woman there who before I got there, and I've actually got the notes from the call, right? I'm going to be there for you, Sally. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you navigate this place, et cetera. And I kept going to her for advice because I'm not a completely stupid woman. I said, you know, I, I, I feel like this isn't working well. I feel like as I'm doing this isn't working well. I'm not feeling like I'm not part of the team. Can you help me? And she just kept telling me, you're doing great. You're doing great. You're doing great. Up until the moment she was across the table from me when I was getting let oh, go, yeah. right? right? And I'm like, oh, now I get, now it. I get it. I got it, right? So yeah, it's happened to me. It's happened probably to, any, to all of us. And again, it goes back to that research about how it can be hard as humans to have empathy for people who are going through what you went through. We need to just be aware of this and, and get over this, I think. And then we just need to stop letting ourselves be pitted against each other. Yes. Yes. So, he, so this was so interesting for me last week. So interesting. I, I'm going to, okay, I'm going to do a trust game right now because I'm going to share a name and then I, I'm going to trust you not to tweet it. So, so, so look, um, because I have such respect for this woman. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm starting Elevest. You know, in, by some circles, people look at this and say, well, that looks like LearnVest, right? Which Alexa mm -hmm. Von Tobel started, mm -hmm. which recently sold to Northwestern Mutual. The reported price was $250 million. The actual price was $350 million. So it was above 250, but it was 350. Um, and these things sort of look like each other, right? This what you both towards women, they both got the vest in the name. The difference is they're, they're different approaches. Yeah. Ours is going to be an investment management platform. Hers is um, more around um, classes and budgeting and financial plans and sort of stops before it gets to investing. And so as we have this announcement and there's some news around it, I had three different people over the course of three or four days, a couple of reporters, other senior women, who, who let me know and tried to bait me into saying how that business had been unsuccessful, mm. right? Mm. And I'm like, she friggin' sold her business for three hundred and fifty million, effing million exactly. dollars. Exactly. And somehow it's us women. They're trying to give me like beep 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 beep. You know, yeah. she she's you know, oh yeah. You know, and then it's oh she was only successful because she did this or she did she was it was, she was promotional. You know, she was on radio and 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 people are trying to sort of pull her down. They're trying to bait me into it. We have got to stop, stop it. That. Right? Stop that. We, we cannot. If she had sold for a billion dollars, that in no way negatively impacts me. Right? Or any of us. No. It's only it good looks. for us. Yes. And for us to, and, and we know where it comes from, right? We, we know that urge that's there. And all of us, and if any of us say we've never done it, we're no, lying, right? We all know that secret way to seem like we're being supportive of another woman and then just eh, cut her. And, and with such a sharp razor, she doesn't even know, well, she knows it happened, but the guys are looking like, no, she it's great. It's all, y'all are all together, right? We all know it. We all know it. And, for, and, and, there, and again, there's the reason we did it, which is the table was only a certain size and we got it, right? But I think what this group is doing, this celebrating each other let, you know, by this great leadership that Lisa and this board have, um, I think is just tremendous. I think what y'all are doing, and we have to. We tried the other way, guys, where we waited for the guys to give us our turn. It doesn't work, no. right? So it's time for us to come together and, and really stand in our power. Wonderful. On that thank note, you. we're going to thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Fabulous. Just fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.